So the novelist uh, named Wallace Stenger once wrote, it is the beginning of wisdom when you recognize that the best you can do is choose which rules you want to live by. And it is persistent and aggravated imbecility to pretend you can live without any rules. <laughs> I love that word, imbecility. I think we can all agree that we need rules. We need them for ourselves. I know I have to be really careful about what I eat. There's a lot of heart disease in my family tree, and I know if I want to live a healthier, longer life, I can't eat much in the way of sugar, fat, and carbs. I've got to exercise. So there are rules I follow about that, and I've found it makes a big difference for me to embrace the sense that following those rules is not a chore, it's not a negative thing, and it's not depriving me of anything. Instead, following those rules is a choice that I am making. I need those rules, but I'm still the one in charge of following them. Now, that doesn't mean I would not still love to steal that slice of warm pecan pie topped with vanilla ice cream right off your plate. It only means I'll just stare at it lovingly. We also need rules to navigate life with other people. We need to practice civility and patience and consideration for the needs of others. We need standards of conduct so that there's justice and fairness in our relationships, both personally and as a society. And like any personal rules we follow, the rules we have in place that relate to others are better understood as a good thing rather than anything that's a burden or that deprives us or infringes somehow on our needs. Those broader rules we live by are part of a social compact we have with others. If my dog digs a hole in my neighbor's yard, then I'm responsible for that damage. So I'm going to fill that hole, patch up that grass, and do all I can to make sure my dog does not do that again. And even apologize to my neighbor. I, I might even take a pecan pie over to my neighbor to demonstrate my regret, a sign of goodwill, a peace offering for all the trouble I've caused and I can't eat it anyway, so it's all good. That's a rule I think we'd all strive to live by, to treat our neighbor as we would want to be treated if their dog damaged our property. Well, a simple rule like that, or a rule of written law, let's say a rule that prohibits insider trading on the stock market, or a rule that says when you're driving and you pull up to a red octagonal sign that reads stop and you actually stop, those rules are based on what we can agree or what's true and what is not true. So, for instance, if we have a law against insider trading, we've agreed that it is an objective truth that trading stock in a way that benefits yourself when you have information that no one else has, that's just not fair. And we've all agreed it's an objective truth that stopping at a stop sign will prevent people from getting hurt at that intersection. It's about preserving the safety of others and yourself. But what happens when we cannot agree on what's true? What if a law is passed, as it was in Germany in 1935, that prohibited Jewish people from holding citizenship, or from marrying non-Jews, or restricting or taking away their property rights and other legal protections? Those laws, those rules, were based on what the Nazi party claimed was absolutely true about Jews. What if the rules at your workplace were that a woman who has the same responsibilities and qualifications and experience as a man gets paid only about 75% of what her male colleague gets paid? Because that's roughly where things still stand in the United States. And what's the truth behind a rule like that? Would that be an objective truth everyone could agree on? It's not as cut and dried as you might think. Not all that long ago, it was understood to be the objective, unimpeachable truth among many, if not most people in Western societies, that homosexuality was a deviant behavioral trait. Some believed that was true on moral or religious grounds, and others believed it was true because it, they believed it was a psychiatric disorder. Those were the prevailing accepted truths, and laws then followed suit. So you could be fired from your job, denied housing, suffer all kinds of discrimination, and meanwhile be told by religious people that God considered you an abomination and unworthy of God's love. Now that truth has been demonstrated to be false, 
at least for the majority of people, believe that. And so the rules, the laws have changed, and with a new and improved understanding of what's true, our cultural attitudes about homosexuality have rapidly changed too. What was once considered a crime and a sin is now understood as a perfectly natural difference based on the huge spectrum of variations within humankind. So, if our rules are based on what people understand as truths, and we know that what's true for some people is not true for others, and some old rules deserve to be challenged and broken, I think it's fair to ask, are there any rules, any codes of conduct that we can say are always universally and objectively true? That's not a hypothetical question. It matters. And the impact is both personal and it touches everyone. For instance, if your truth is that COVID is a hoax, and although it might make some people sick, you're not concerned about it because you can't trust what the medical community is saying, and even if it is easily transmittable through the air, you should not be required to wear a a face mask because that infringes on your liberty, or that the whole thing is a political plot. Well, if, if that's the truth you believe in or promote, then you're probably less likely to wear a mask and practice social distancing and to believe that those of us who do are fools or that we've been duped or we're intentionally trying to wreck the economy in order to influence the upcoming election. We all know many of our fellow citizens, our neighbors, friends, and family members, all of, for, for them, all of what I said is the truth. I, I think perhaps it's been demonstrated in a rather dramatic fashion this past week that the opposite is true. COVID does not discriminate. The issue is, whatever enough people believe is the truth, whether it's true or not, results in the rules we all find ourselves living by. So let's talk about a certain set of rules we have all heard about, what we call the Ten Commandments. What truth are they based on? And what can we learn from them about the nature of truth itself? Well, the story goes, Moses had recently led the children of Israel out of Egypt where they had been slaves. And that's an important point to remember because the rules they lived under previously in Egypt were unjust. After all, they were slaves. (laughs) They had no rights. They were treated as property of the state. Every aspect of the conduct of their lives was controlled and imposed upon them. So the truth they lived under was whatever Pharaoh decided was the truth. But now they were free. And they found themselves in a place where the truth they had known did not exist anymore. They were free as birds, except where they were, roaming through the wilderness with very little in the way of a social structure to guide them, and with no set of rules to live by, it became evident pretty soon that something had to happen if they hoped to survive. So what was their truth? Their shared truth was that they had been delivered from bondage by a power they could not fully comprehend. Their common truth was that they'd taken an enormous risk by escaping, but they pinned their hopes on believing the benefits of freedom outweighed the misery of slavery. But the competing truth was many of them were not so sure about that anymore. Maybe it had been a bad idea. Some of them wanted to return, even to a truth and to rules that denied their own humanity. At least there were rules of some kind back in Egypt. Many, if not most of them, could not wrap their minds around the concept of a God that you could not see, but who was everywhere all at once. They preferred the old-fashioned kind of gods you could handle and manipulate and try to use to get what you wanted. So the story tells us that unseen God, through Moses, delivered a set of basic rules. And like all rules, they were based on a truth. The first rule in the Ten Commandments makes that crystal clear because it's not so much a rule as it is a statement of fact. It says, I am the Lord your God, and all of the things that you spend your time worshiping are a delusion. They're not the truth. Your gods of wealth, success, status, or power. And then it gets specific. Don't make idols representing those gods. 
So don't fool yourselves into believing that any material object will ever elevate you or satisfy you because you're already worthy. Don't try to value yourself or make yourself feel better by having more stuff. You're already valuable and loved, and people matter more than things. What you should value most, what you must wake up to, is your connection, your oneness, with the sacredness of all life, all people, all of creation, and the love that ties it all together. And that love has a name. God. Now, we could analyze that first commandment all day long, but... Let's just say that everything, all the rules that follow, come from that one basic truth, and they reflect back onto that one truth. So up next, don't use God as an excuse to justify anything. It's just not your prerogative to ever assume to speak for God, and it's really manipulative. It's never okay to say to anyone, you're sinful or wrong because God says so. That's not your place. Your place is to be peacefully present with God and with all people. So own up to your own bias of what you think is right or wrong, but let God be God because you're not. And then the next two commandments pretty much flow together because they have to do with time management and self-care. Take at least one day off every week. Work hard and do good work and everything, but take intentional time to remember and reflect on the truth of who you are, your connection to the holy, and how much you are loved. Remember how valuable and worthy you are, how unique you are, and all the good stuff flowing through your life. Give thanks for that, and give thanks for all the loving relationships you have. Because you know what? Life is really short, and you need to pay attention to the people who matter to you. Make that time sacred because you're sacred and all of life is sacred and to amplify that commandment comes the next one honor your parents and take care of and pay attention to your family whatever your family might look like even those folks in your family who are voting for someone you cannot stand see the big picture because those are the most significant relationships you're probably ever going to have And remember, there is such a thing as karma. So don't forget that your kids are the ones who are going to take care of you when you're old. Or maybe not, but that's up to you right now. (laughs) Then we get into crimes and misdemeanors. So this is where we find the basics for how a civil society should operate. Such as, as, don't murder people. Duh. We just weren't made for that. Life and death are not ours to give or take away. We're only designed to live and live fully by giving ourselves away for the sake of others. Then, don't commit adultery. I mean, it's just not cool, dude. It really causes lasting harm to innocent people, and it devalues and dishonors everyone. You don't have to be a prude to believe that. You just have to be a grown-up. So grow up. (laughs) And then don't steal stuff. Be honest with your word and your actions. Don't say one thing and do another. Don't take anything away from anyone else that doesn't belong to you, especially if you live in Texas, because those people will shoot you. (laughs) And related to that, Don't tell lies about someone else. Be focused on your own integrity. It's never worth messing with someone else's life to make yourself look better. Again, grow up. And finally, stop it already with comparing yourself to other people all the time and feeling envious about what they have. Everyone is equally valuable, and whatever wealth or cool stuff they have is ultimately just stuff. If they have a great relationship with their family, good for them, but you are you. And you're not doing yourself or them any favors by thinking, if only I could be like that. That is a total waste of your life because you have more important things to accomplish while you're on the planet than comparing yourself to other people. You're already valuable and loved. Remember? So, those are the Ten Commandments. At least, the David Green version. 
Those are the rules, ancient rules, that I think still apply today and that I believe are indeed grounded in objective truth. A lot of the things we perceive day to day as truths and rules based on those truths, those may change. History proves that over and over again. And some rules just need to be challenged or broken. Any rule that devalues another person, any rule that denies the full humanity and worth of someone, that's not a rule worth following because it's not based on the most important rule of all, that we're all created in the image of God. And God is love, a love that knits every one of us together, no matter the little gods and idols that we assign so much importance to. Our value is inherent, and it's built in. We're already loved, and we live in an ocean of love. But our, our problem so often is sometimes we're like fish swimming in water without knowing what water even is. The Ten Commandments is about waking up to the truth, that we live and breathe in a vast web of love, and that the truth, that our, the truth is that our job, uh, while we have life and breath, is to just act like it. To treat our neighbors, all people, as though we are all pieces of the same family quilt, because we are. We are the embodiment of God to each other and for each other. It's, it's like that old camp song I used to sing at church camp. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. That's the one truth that will never die. It's the one rule to live by and to love by.